Even some who were born and raised in Norco raise an eyebrow in surprise when I tell them that the name is short for North Corona. So, one can imagine that most outsiders know us as the place with all the horses. However, the other big thing Horsetown USA is known for is having some of the prettiest girls in Southern California. If you ask any of us homers, we'd reckon we got the prettiest in the world. Anyone with eyes could see that the daughters of this city have more sparkle than the ones on the coast, more bite than the ones in the city, and more savvy than the ones in the hills. And it should go without saying that the road to the prettiest women in the world would have to be one that ran through California. I never knew Brian Wilson or Mike Love to be liars. Having myself been born and raised in this particular divot of Riverside County, I naturally became accustomed to a rather high level of the gender opposite to mine from the moment I laid eyes on my first, my mother being a local girl herself. From that moment on, I spent my social hours around the pigtails and shin-length dresses of these Orphic beings, doing my best to attract the attention of the ones I found particularly entrancing. Of course, there are no roses without thorns, cardiac muscle was overused and subsequently damaged, and things obviously didn't work out with every partner. Fortunately for all parties involved, I was wise enough to understand that it only needed to work once, so every time I found myself still ailing from the violent wreckage that was a breakup with a Norco girl, I bandaged my wounds as best as I could and get right back up on that horse. And thank God I did, because at a point that seemed to take a long time while it was happening, and now feels like I never had to wait at all, I found my life partner. The thing is, when I did find the woman that I'd be lucky enough to call my wife, the story wasn't all that exciting. Truth be told, we were a love on sight match, and the process of converting strangers to spouses was pretty straightforward. That just seems the way it goes with soulmates and whatnot. However, part of the reason that was so smooth was a direct result of the wisdom and skill set that both she and I had acquired independently through our past mistakes. In my case, there were three. The old lady likes to call them karmic partners. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk a little about those almosts and maybes. Here's the thing to keep in mind while I do. Generally in life, your failures will tell you more about yourself than your successes will. And when it comes to relationships, or love if you will, the ones that came the closest to being the real thing, and more importantly, their deficiencies and the insufficiencies they revealed in you, will give you some very important insight on why that one special partner finally got you to that altar. And with that being made clear, let's talk about Adele. They mostly come in blonde down here, but Adele was a brunette. Long, frizzy curls rained down onto her shoulders as she sang and danced all throughout our lunch periods. She was the star of every musical and never let anyone forget it. Even her normal speaking voice had a sort of oscillating timbre to it, and damn if I didn't just love to eavesdrop on her gossiping in the back of our government class just to hear the sounds of her tenor, like listening to a bird sing about how her mom wasn't being fair. We all figured she would become a movie star, or at least have her fair share of featured guest spots on some daytime soap. Looking back, that was probably just because she was such an extroverted force in such a quiet environment. Norco isn't exactly Hollywood, even if it is just an hour or two drive. It was this very hollowed aura that froze me in my tracks whenever the thought of even saying a polite hello crossed my mind. I figured that it spot my chances at being her date to the spring dance at just a hair above zero even though there really was nothing I wanted more. Myself, I was a baseball player, and that was naturally the clique within which I associated. As a theater kid, you might guess that Adele's and my groups didn't mix too much. Most of my pals found their steadies among the cheerleaders, the soccer players, or even the types that listen to bands like The Misfits and Ozzy Osbourne. Obviously, I would never go for that last subset, Trading my soul for a little necking was not a deal I was prepared to make at that point. Not to mention the risk of having my dad find one of those records in my room and promptly whooping my ass out to Eastvale. Anyway, I looked at it. If I wanted that lanky brunette to wear my letterman, and I most certainly did, I would have to engineer a breach of junior high school decorum and break through into an unfamiliar territory, the Performing Arts Building. I had a bit of an advantage with this task because... 
Due to my lack of preparation and picking my classes, I was forced to round out my load with the only class that still had openings, Shakespeare in movies. My procrastination had proven itself essential because the classroom was adjacent to the performing arts building for obvious reasons. I also had the fortune of having this class right before the lunch period that I shared with Adele, so all I had to do was stall long enough after class and I'd probably run into her on the way back to my locker. It took me about three weeks of recon, but I eventually did. There were a few times I saw her, but she was flanked by some friends and it would be hard enough to approach her alone, so I bid my time. This became a problem soon enough because I was getting far too comfortable at just seeing her walk by me every day. Something about the way she would only walk on her tippy toes when excited just swept me up in a kind of euphoric bliss that I had never experienced, and I went straight up numb and plain stupid when that hit. I even found myself looking forward to sitting through slop like Orson Welles' Othello, just because it meant that I was moments from seeing the object of my affection for those brief seconds that always pass much too quickly. That's about as dangerous as thinking comes, and I even knew it back then. So, when the day finally came where she made it down that walkway alone, I acted. No hesitation whatsoever. Adele was about as close to a movie star as I'd ever get, and if I wanted to believe otherwise, my sweaty palms, shaky knees, and upturned gut would have set me straight right away. I knew the more I dragged this out, the more I'd embarrass myself, so I went right in and started talking about our shared government class. Turned out she cared about as little for that class as I did. So we steered the conversation around to talk about her upcoming performance in the spring musical. By the time we made our way down to her locker, I got all the info I needed. I was about to go see my first piece of live theater. What I did then was continue to take my time and work on the not overwhelming her part of my wooing. When we did chat, I made sure to ask about rehearsals and made it clear that I was very interested in how it was all coming together although not particularly interested in her, which I now, of course, realize was about as stupid a strategy as one could employ when trying to charm someone. However, I could tell that she was starting to look forward to our little talks by how her eyes would light up. Among many other things, Adele taught me that the best thing you can do to begin the process of gaining the affection of your special someone is as simple as taking an interest in what they're passionate about. You'd be surprised how much that can make a person gravitate toward you. Unfortunately, if I wanted her little hand in mine for the first dance of the new semester, I'd have to gravitate a little closer than that, and I was running out of time to do so. My plan was to make a grand gesture on the opening night of her show. I had the whole thing set. Flowers, my best shirt. I even called ahead at the rodeo burger to let them know that I would be sure to leave a substantial tip if they could promise me the best table that Saturday night. Figured Adele might not necessarily be keen on going on a traditional date with me, but I didn't know anyone who could resist the best burgers in Norco. What ended up happening was ironically more dramatic than whatever the hell it was that hit the stage that night. I went alone, of course. Still couldn't let any of my boys know that I was interested in a theater type, and definitely couldn't let them know that I was going to go so far as to sit through something where people sang about their feelings. Even I didn't care for the performance that much. Outside of seeing Adele float along the boards, that is, glowing and singing like one of God's highest classes of angels. And I really did sit through the entire thing, too. Didn't even get up during the intermission. And when they came on stage for their bow, I stood along with the rest of the crowd, clapping like a madman. I must have been pretty loud because my darling looked right at me with those big, bright pools of green. Then she smiled even bigger and gave me the rush that was being the target of a flurry of her waves. That made the whole thing worthwhile, even after what happened next. Once the crowds cleared out, I took the flowers to the back, and after talking my way through some pipsqueak stagehand who thought he was the chief of security, I made my way to the dressing room. I waited patiently outside to give her the time she needed. Figured I would be waiting on her a lot if we started to go together, so best get the practice in. Didn't take long for her to emerge with a group of girls, chatting and screeching like they do. Adele had since removed that heavy stage makeup and had her hair tied up with a ball cap on. It was the most beautiful she had ever looked. So beautiful, in fact, that I didn't notice the bouquet she already had in her hands. She saw me and was so filled with adrenaline after a killer show that she put her arms around my neck, which had me all but helpless. 
She told me how happy she was to see me there, thanked me for supporting the show, then asked how I liked it after clarifying that I should speak freely. We eventually got around to me giving her the flowers, and she made the comment on how sweet I was. Then she dropped the bomb. The much bigger bouquet that she was holding was sent by her new boyfriend, and who I could assume was also her spring dance date. He wasn't present because he had a game that night. A baseball game. Apparently that was her type, and that was indeed his cap on her pretty little head. He was a gentleman, though, and thus he'd made sure to order the flower delivery beforehand. It was a big move for them because they had only been seeing each other for a few weeks. In fact, they had met right about the time I was busy going through draft after draft of my big plan to ask her out. Had I just asked her to rodeo burger the first time we spoke, or even within that first month? Well, ifs and buts. So, I told her one more time how great she had done, and I let her go. She walked off with her friends to the cast party, and I continued to wave when I saw her around school. Fortunately, we never shared a class again. We never spoke again either. I was far too embarrassed and felt so foolish in how I was both too slow in my action and too cowardly to let her know of my intentions. I felt right stupid for not thinking that there were probably other boys, not just from our school, on whom she was unknowingly working her magic, and I had initiated early enough, but no one cares who scores the first run, especially when that team ends up on the losing end when the last out is made. Adele became known as nothing more than an early but necessary failure. A lasting scar on my pride as a reminder of the price one pays for waiting. Lucky for me, I lived in Norco, and there were plenty more pretty girls with whom to fail. I got a job at a garage my junior year, and I worked it up until I left with the core. My dad's friend said that his buddy owned a shop that was looking for a young guy to come in and lend a hand for a few bucks and some experience. After a quick interview, they offered to take me on as an apprentice mechanic. Just like that, I was a working man. I fixed all kinds of cars, trucks, station wagons, work vans, even the post office would bring a truck or two down to the shop if they needed something touched up real fast. I enjoyed the work, so to speak. It was hard labor, but I appreciated the process of diagnosing problems and getting my hands coated in oil and other fluids as I saw to it that these problems dissipated. Plus, my boss always let us personally hand back the keys to the ones we worked on. There was a real sense of pride every time I got to give them back to a customer, knowing full well that their car was running as good as it was the day they drove it off the lot. Made all the hours, sweat, and extra showers worthwhile. On a day about eight months into my time at the garage, a young woman drove up in her little black Toyota. Truth be told, the first thing I noticed was just how little care had been taken in, at the very least, the exterior of this vehicle. But that all changed once I got a look at the interior, more specifically, at who was driving it. Her name was Alexandria, and she had a mastery of an aesthetic that I came to refer to as sloppy beauty. She didn't wear any makeup outside of a little inconsistent eyeliner. Her Johnny Cash shirt was wrinkled. Her vans had holes right at the point where the creases form, on both feet. Her ponytail even stuck a little bit together at the ends, which I assumed was because of the high amount of oil and whatnot within it. She was also about three years older than me, which gave me what I thought to be a first-class ticket to adulthood and general maturity. Figure that's worth mentioning, too. I sprinted out to attend to the new face, and... After she gave me the update on what was troubling her means of transport, I asked her to grab a seat, made her some coffee myself, then went to swapping out the old fan belt. In case you don't know, it's a pretty routine job, especially when you're outfitted like we were. The only thing keeping my customer there longer than she needed was the fact that every time I came around the car, I just had to stop to stare. Like I said, she wasn't one of those jaw-dropping types that made your tongue swell up and had you forgetting essential memories like what your name was. She just had something where I couldn't take my eyes off her. Could say it was something in the soul. My brain just couldn't get a grip on what my eyes and my heart were telling it. 
My mind had its way of going around in circles, and it seemed to want to orbit around one quality of hers in particular. I had always had a habit of looking down at a woman's hands upon meeting. There was a lot you could tell from simple features like nail color, length, any dry spots, calluses, or dozens of other giveaways that painted a flawed and incomplete but still useful portrait of someone that you could only get through something as often overlooked as their hands. It's about the same for men, too. When it came to Alexandria, there was one quality that stood out over the others, which was how just past the chip black nail polish and arrow tattoo on her left ring finger was a piece of metal, but one that didn't make its way all the way around, so I thought it was safe to say that she wasn't bound by valves. Right as I started to let my mind drift to how she could very well still be spoken for, I stopped myself. I stopped, and I thought about Adele. The fact was, the only reason that Adele and I had not had a nice little tenure as a couple, one that very well could have still been in its prime, was solely due to the choice I made in delaying the start. Truth be told, ever since Adele, I had a hard time with women. I didn't date all that much, and I have to admit that I plain avoided them as much as I could. I couldn't let a girl like this slip away again, and I definitely couldn't let this pattern of fear-led action continue. So, I shut out these impeding ideas as best as I could. It was the only choice I had, after all. It was either act against them, or spend my life alone. What do they say about burning your tongue on hot milk once, then blowing on yogurt for the rest of your life? Yeah, that wasn't going to be me. I strapped in the new belt, had the boys give it a courtesy wash, and went out to inform Alex about the successful repair. She was still sitting there with her legs spread out, counter to one might expect from a traditional lady, thumbing through the eight-month-old copy of Rolling Stone on the table. She stood that way as I gave her the news that she was about 15 minutes and $50 from being back to her normal doings. She nodded and gave a mandatory thank you as I did my best to gauge her interest in me, which I later would learn is almost always a waste of time. Women, like anyone really, rarely know what they want and they usually need to see it in motion before they even recognize that they would be interested in whatever it is you're presenting to them. Of course, I wouldn't learn any of this until I started working sales. I succeeded in skipping past my natural tendency to stall, and I told her flat out that I dug her style. That comment immediately softened her up and even evoked a nice smile, showing off her adorably oversized teeth that came together in about the brightest collection of bridge work I'd ever seen. It was enough to get me to ask her if she had dinner plans, and by process, set up our first date. To skip the more boring details, I'll jump ahead to about 10 months later. I was in my senior year now, and we had had more than one discussion about me just packing up and moving into her place. We were about as in love as at least I'd ever been, and I figured I'd end up with her because, well, why not? She was pretty, cool as all hell, and she liked me. Couldn't really ask for more. That's at least what I thought at that very, very young age. Then, as these things tend to do, a highly imperative issue came up. Fortunately for all parties involved, we encountered and had a lengthy chat about it before I even got the chance to move into her place and reach that next level of intimacy. One night, I think it was a Wednesday, I brought Alex some chow mein and orange chicken after my shift. Never one to be hurt by being called unladylike, Alex scooped forkful after forkful into her mouth, allowing the grease and excess to spill all around her cheeks, almost like a child. Like I said, I was about as far in love with her as I ever was with anyone, so I started to think about how cute a little version of her would look slurping up happy walk like that. I know this might not be what your typical 18-year-old fantasizes about when it comes to a pretty lady, but it's what went through my mind. I told her what I was thinking. And I noticed that after she laughed, she took a pretty big swig of her MGD. So I pressed. No time for delays, remember? I started a certain conversation, which is often the tell that you and your gal are getting very serious. I asked her if she wanted kids. She laughed again, which was of course the answer. But she clarified by saying that she never really thought she would. We went through the motions of talking about it for a little while, But looking back, that was an exercise in futility, because the initial laugh told me all I really needed to know. I always saw myself as being a dad one day. I looked forward to it from as early as I can remember. Naturally, 
That meant I always pondered how my girlfriends would be as mothers from sometimes as early as the first date. I even imagined what 13-year-old Adele would be like as a mom back then, before I even spoke a word to her. Having kids was one of those non-negotiables. Always had been. So, what now? The answer to that was simple too. Break up. The toughest part of my time with Alexandria, which made sense because she was perfect in every other moment, was also the part I was the most proud of, because I knew for a fact I couldn't be with someone who didn't want children. And all those maybes and not sures just don't cut it with something like that. Don't mean to brag too much, but I'd say that was a pretty wise move from a boy that age. The way she looked at me that night, I could tell my face was telling her all that I was thinking. She tried to change the subject to save face, and I went along with it. After dinner, I said goodnight and headed back to my place. The next day, we called it quits. We decided that we wanted different things. Simple, and maybe as cliche as that. Although, nowhere near as easy as it sounds. Alex was a dream. She was the coolest chick I ever went with, and I know she would have been a kick-ass wife, and a fantastic mother if she ever changed her mind. Yet, that was her choice, and even if she was willing to change it for me, I'd never let her. She had her path and I had mine. It was the right thing to say goodbye and let her find someone who was taking the same streets as she was. Same went with me, of course. Sadly, but again, probably for the best, that would be the last time I ever saw her. I had just come back from overseas when I met Rochelle. My dad told me two tours was enough and it was time to build a life in my own country. Find a wife, have some kids, and contribute to the world in ways where I wouldn't need a rifle in my hands to do it. I was itching for something to do, and a buddy of mine had it set up where a few of us would drive up to Nevada and work on a farm for the three months of summer. Everyone wants to be a cowboy, and we were the type of guys who weren't satisfied with wanting. So when the opportunity presented itself, we took it. As summer started to preheat, we got our gear together, packed up my buddy's Bronco, and started out on the road, which was oftentimes the best part. I won't waste your time talking about Nevada because, as you might guess, there wasn't much in that desert that would fall under the category of exciting or even interesting. You probably got that when I mentioned that the road trip portion was the most memorable. Along those same lines, finally getting back home to the in-comparison hustle and bustle of Norco was one of the most rewarding parts. Not only did we ride back with our pockets about as fat as they ever got, but so much would always change over the summers. It was like we got to rediscover a whole new town. Some folks might have had new cars in their driveways, others painted their decks, and of course, there were a few new faces here and there. First stop back was always Cowgirl Cafe. A cup of coffee and a stack of pancakes with some butter and a little gravy drizzled on top. Just a little. That was how we knew we were home. We pulled up, hopped out, and Hostess Marge directed us to grab a table. She filled our mugs to the brim and let us know she'd put in the usual orders for us. Now came the toughest part of it all. The long wait from that first sip of coffee to the first bite of short stack. However, it turned out today's wait wouldn't be all that onerous at all. See, one of those new faces I was talking about came around almost right away, carrying a fresh pot. Not more than 5'1", and with honey blonde hair that barely fell past her ears, she had me dead to rights the second her blue eyes lifted to meet mine. I'd never fallen faster. Maybe it was the confidence gained by having some money to my name, but I succeeded in containing my mood and said a polite hello and thank you as she managed to match Marge's acumen for full cup pouring, no easy task. From there, the entire afternoon was now just blissful moments when Rochelle was at our table and the excruciating wait for her to come back. By the end of the meal, we pulled our bills together and to leave about a 50% tip and scurried out real quick for dramatic effect. That was until I lied about leaving my watch behind so I could go back in and get Rochelle's number. 
still employing the lessons I learned during my Adele failure. The next thing I did is not something I'm particularly proud of, but you'll see it put me right where I needed to be, so I don't regret it. I grabbed the cash from the table, bid my time until she came around again. Then when she did, I stopped her. Like I said, it might have been the bills in my pocket, or the ones in my hand, but I was all confidence that day. I told her that we all found her service absolutely excellent, and as such, wanted to show her our appreciation via this inflated gratuity. When I saw her blush, I knew the tip was coming second to the extra attention in terms of what was making that darling heart of hers race. We went back and forth with a little small talk, me asking her about how long she's been serving, her asking me if I was from around here. Then I went in and asked if I could take her to dinner sometime. She said that sounded like a plan, and just like that, we had our date all set. I took two steps away before realizing I needed to ask one more thing before I left. At some point in your life, doesn't have to be now, are you interested in having children? She was. Now's the part where I tell you where it all went to hell. No one locked up my feelings faster than Rochelle, so I guess it'd only be natural to expect that our breakup would hurt the most. Sometimes, I even think it hurt more than all the others combined. Let me get to some happier times real quick. Similar to Alexandria, we took to each other right away. One thing about my approach to the opposite sex, I might not have been a man of quantity, but when I did pick them, they were good ones. We dated for a good three months or so, and since I knew she did want kids and I had my head about as far over my heels as my anatomy allowed, I asked her if she'd like to move in with me. Added another three months of us cohabitating, and I went ahead and asked her to be my wife. Naturally, she picked up an assortment of fancy notebooks and began the earliest stages of planning the wedding almost right away. She wanted a spring date, which gave us a good eight or so months to get it organized. I told her from the start that I'd go along with anything she wanted. I was warned early on by my dad that the wedding day is often the most important date in a marriage, and by consequence, a life. How that day is planned and how it is executed dictates the entire tone for the partnership. Screw that up, and it's going to be a long and painful collaboration. Or, maybe even worse, a very short and forgettable one. According to the old man, he had seen that happen more than a few times. Over the next weeks, she would show me colors, tablecloths, menus, bridesmaid dresses, chair options, fonts, even potential hairstyles on which she actually wanted my opinion. I loved her deeply, though, so I gave each presentation my full attention and gave it about as detailed a review as I could. This went on for quite a while, which is how I learned that my dream girl was one of those girls they make fun of as never knowing where she wants to eat. Except Rochelle always knew where she wanted to grab a bite. She just had issues with everything else. Literally. One point to really hammer about this whole ordeal. A nugget of advice, if you will. Have yourself an extended engagement period. By all means, let yourself be swept up in the thrills of the fall, and if it feels right, go ahead and propose as early as you know they're your match. That's all fine, but don't you tie that knot until at least one year after your person says yes, because the engagement is the final test. A test that Rochelle and I didn't score so high on. Funny enough, it all started with the food. Having lost numerous grandparents to heart disease and having a few relatives still suffering from veganism, my fiancé was opposed to red meat in general. She had some chicken now and again, but for the most part was a seafood type of woman. She came to me and suggested we do a seafood-only affair, not just because her entire side would only eat from the ocean, but if we could cut the beef, we could save more than a buck. That wasn't going to happen. Despite what my father recommended, I knew he would grant an exception in this case, because a wedding where you skimp on the side of the guests was one that wouldn't necessarily harm your bond, but it would flatten your reputation, which just as easily could sink your partnership. I'll admit there was a pride element to it. Certainly didn't want my wedding to be talked about as the one where I showed my tight-fisted colors. That's where I learned that this marriage wedding thing had more to it than just doing what the bride says. I put my foot down and told her that she could choose absolutely anything else, 
but she had to allow for a decent meal, considering this was about as important a moment as there was for us, and all those beautiful people we call family. She relented, understanding that we should make these decisions as a couple, even though she was sure to clarify that this was not what I had initially decreed. We hit another snag when she told me her bridesmaids totaled at eight, which meant about double the amount of dresses and makeup for which I had rather foolishly budgeted. The cost wasn't even the issue as much as the fact that I was now expected to fill eight spots when I only had two, maybe three good buddies outside of my best man. I didn't want to add to her complications by explaining this to her, but I also didn't know where I could find four random men to be a part of the biggest day of my life. Figured this was a job for the best man if there ever was one, so I met up with my longtime buddy Marcus and told him I needed his little brother to be on his best behavior so he wouldn't be locked up in county for my nuptials. That, and we needed to scramble up four more dudes to round us out. Marcus was just as confused as I was, but I told him it's what my bride wanted, and I already made her compromise on another issue, so I wasn't about to continue along that path. I went ahead and started this thing by filling out some of the guys at the garage, even though I was always pretty strict about keeping those fellas at an arm's distance. wasn't too eager to have them knowing too much about my personal life, giving them free ammunition to rib me during those long work days. We never said a word about our ladies or our kids, or anything even remotely private. This held for working hours, breaks, and even our poker nights. Served us just fine. A guy by the name of Robert was the first one I got alone. Told him I was getting married, no one had heard yet, and that the date was coming up. I knew we had a wife at home, so I figured it was safe territory. Luckily, we were working on a pretty nasty oil mishap, so we had plenty of time to talk about things in between, like the angels, local gossip, and anything at all that didn't have to do with my wedding. By the end of the shift, I knew Robert was in on joining the wedding party, and just to be sure, I also let him know that I had made the decision to include a whole fifth of Jack as part of the groomsmen gifts. I sped home that night to update Rochelle on my success. Let me tell you, the way her cheeks blew up with that smile... One that rivaled both Adele's on that opening night and Alexandria's when I complimented her outfits. It had me just about ready to head back out and ask any man on the street to round out those eight spots. As it turned out, I wouldn't get the chance. That very night, another topic came up. A big one. Since I've already set the precedent, I'll keep it simple. Turned out that Rochelle had a set date in mind for the nuptials, and all of her work was finally starting to fit together perfectly. She gave the reverend at her church a call to inquire, and then set about on a visit to meet with him not too much later. When she came back, she gave me the news. Church was booked that day, and the earliest we could get in would be two months after. Then, she dropped the real bomb. After hearing the counteroffer from the reverend, she went ahead and visited two of her backup venues, both of which were available for her date, and neither of which were Houses of God. That wasn't open for discussion. It was one thing to suggest that Reverend Davis might not be the one to bless our union, but an entirely different one to ask me to have the Lord himself skip the vows. In fact, even the suggestion was enough to have me put a pause on all the organization, which of course broke her heart. Unfortunately, I wasn't trained in how to fix that type of damage, which meant my heart was next into the grinder. Just like I had to do with Alexandria, I took a good look at myself and was as honest as I could be. Despite the way she made me feel and the love I had for her, were we really a match that could withstand all the threats life would send our marriage? Life is hard, and the degree to which our partnership would ease or stress that level of difficulty would be entirely dependent on our compatibility. Pick someone you don't fit with, shoot, even for a short road trip. You'll see almost immediately how hard every little simple task becomes. I don't even want to know how much that magnifies when you throw kids, mortgages, and everything else into that mix. We went ahead and broke up not too much later. Looking back, it all seemed to go by in a flash. Rochelle and I didn't speak much after, and we eventually reestablished our roles as strangers. But she gave me a skill that I think every serious relationship of mine benefits from today. I was really willing to get my hands dirty finding some extra groomsmen. 
Hell, I was ready to do just about anything that girl wanted for that wedding to go off just like she envisioned. And I don't know if I could have done that for anyone else before her. Rochelle taught me the value and necessity of being selfless in a relationship. Swallowing pride and sacrificing for your partner, while at the same time staying true to yourself and never getting lost in the relationship as an institution as opposed to a partnership. It can be tough to find the line between the two, but I did. And although it hurt more than anything I've ever felt since, I thank God he intervened in that clever way before we made those vows. We all know that the prettiest girls in the world come from Norco. We don't know why, but we can see it as plain as day. I was a lucky man to be born here and find my way among these ladies, and I was even luckier to actually earn some affection from about three of the prettiest of the pretty. Adele, Alexandria, and Rochelle, like all strong women, forged a foolish little boy into the man I am today. No doubt about it. The fact that Norco women are so damn excellent in every way is exactly why I got so many confused looks when I started dating a young lady in the city a couple years after my broken engagement. Yet, it wasn't too long before I made her a wife, then a mother three times over. Yep, even with all the pretty Norco girls, I went and found the prettiest girl I'd ever lay eyes on all the way out in the heart of Studio City of all places. You've heard our story a million times, but now you know what led to it, and what led to you. Had I had the initiative in junior high, you would might be half Adele. Had I loved the idea of being with Alexandria more than I loved myself, you wouldn't even be here. Had I caved on the wedding choices of Rochelle, you'd probably have gotten her blue eyes, but I also reckon our deep differences would have hit an irreconcilable snag, and we might not have even made it that far. Maybe those options wouldn't have been all that bad, but since they'd result in different versions of my blessed life, and more importantly, different versions of you, I'd file them under unacceptable. Three pretty girls that broke your old man's heart, even when he thought it couldn't break any further. Then before I knew it, one made her way into my life that'd make it all worthwhile. She'd have more flair than a teenage starlet, more bite than a raven-haired rebel, and be an even better fit than the girl that had my heart from the moment I saw her. Funny thing is, that same heart wouldn't have been strong enough to properly care for my own family if women like Adele, Alexandria, and Rochelle hadn't have had their opportunity to take their emotional hammers to it. They do say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Each one of those taught me something different, and each had their hand in leading me toward the only one who could have ever loved me the way I needed. And because of them... And it should go without saying, your mother. And me to a lesser degree. North Corona got to add three more pretty girls to its lore. Maybe I'm biased, but I don't think you'll find any prettier, no matter where you go. That was All the Pretty Norco Girls, the second story in our new season. Hope you enjoyed it. A lot gentler than the first one. And way more than what's coming up next week. But anyway, make sure you let me know what you think. Comment, whatever you want to, to get it to me. I definitely want your input as I'm launching this series and keeping it going. Make sure you're telling your friends. Subscribe, because next week we have Den of Dweebs, which is a harsher one. Mother-daughter dynamic, but it's funny. It's got a heist to it. It's got um, COVID elements, vaccines, all that good stuff. So make sure you're there for that one. Keep telling your friends. Subscribe. Keep the word going. Lots more stories coming, including a big multi-part season finale. So be there for that. And as always, thank you for listening.